afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Talk about having distinguished guests today. What could be more exciting than cement? Oh, no, not cement, <laughs> concrete. Boy, are we going to learn the difference between cement and concrete today to start things off. My guests are a familiar local figure, not quite star stage screen and radio, but known to many in the building sector, Mr. Wayne Kawano, a friend of mine for more years than either of us would uh, <laughs> care to count. And he is known as Mr. Concrete in Hawaii, president of the Hawaii Concrete Association. And then from the mainland, Mr. Tian Ping, the government, let's see, what are you? Well, anyway, he's with the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association. And his initials behind his name are Lead AP, C, G, P, P, M, P, and is <laughs> NRMC's Vice President for Sustainability. That's the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association. So very, very distinguished guest. He's in town to give several uh, seminars. Thanks for having me. My huge pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. And first we will cover definitions, since even I could use some education here, concrete versus cement. And I'm going to throw something in about the Roman Empire while we do that. And then we will go into the environmental benefits of concrete, environmental benefits. Wait a minute. Con of all the heavy industries in Hawaii, the concrete plant is probably the heaviest, the busiest, the noisiest. How in the world could concrete have any environmental benefits? Well, we're going to find out. And then we will go into individual applications. And my favorite topic, concrete as it applies to building codes. And then I'm going to throw in a Hawaii-specific provision about reflectivity. And that's maybe where, if we have time, where Wayne's going to come in. He's going to explain the difference between the visible light transmittance and its effect on thermal transfer performance between, what is it, 380 and 400 nanometers versus the near infrared of 800 to 1200 nanometers and, again, its effect on thermal transfer. But only if we have uh, time for that, Wayne. So, Mr. Ping, why don't you start off by giving us a definition of concrete versus cement. And anytime you're ready to uh, call up the, the slides, you can certainly do so. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks very much, Howard. Um, if you go up to the first slide, you can see uh, concrete, uh, at least um, the association that I represent, um, is ready-mixed concrete. And uh, ready-mixed concrete um, is basically produced at a batching plant uh, where the ingredients are mixed uh, to a specific uh, recipe and delivered uh, onto the job site with a um, truck-mounted uh, drum uh, uh, that uh, delivers it. You see it on the streets. It's rolling along, uh, making sure the concrete doesn't set um, before it gets to the job site. Um, and uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, concrete is not cement, uh, although many people use the terms interchangeably. Um, cement is just one ingredient of concrete. Uh, the main ingredient, some would say, that adheres or binds all the other ingredients. Um, cement is sort of like the flour for the cake that binds the sand, the rock, uh, water, uh, all together into a uh, durable, hard substance called concrete. Oh, and well, let me throw in a historic question. In the city, the ancient Roman city of Tyre, which is in present-day Lebanon, there is still apparently a, I guess it's a concrete pier built by the Romans 2,000 years ago. So they knew concrete, or maybe it was cement, I don't know. And then when you look at those magnificent aqueducts that the Romans built, those stones were held together with something. Would that be concrete? 
Um, well, the stones were held together with mortar, uh, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it could have some cementitious properties. But yes, the Romans from very early on learned how to use uh, concrete with pozzolans. Pozzolans are sort of the binders uh, that is today uh, what we would use Portland cement, they use these pozzolans from the volcanic ash mm -hmm, from, mm -hmm. uh, that they found and were able to make early concrete. It doesn't have the same s performance applications that uh, we do, but certainly it has lasted many, many thousands of years to which uh, they can still be used today. Some of the Roman roads are still being used today. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff which may lead us into some of the environmental benefits. We don't think in terms of concrete having environmental benefits, but that's one of the big reasons why you traveled all the way to Hawaii. Yeah, uh, there are uh, a number of uh, uh, benefits, environmental benefits, but um, from the architecture and design community standpoint, concrete has always been a favored material mm -hmm. uh, because of its flexibility, durability, how versatile it is. Uh, it can be shaped into any form. Uh, and uh, we've had lots, many, many years of understanding the performance of concrete. And so uh, we've also had many years to innovate uh, mm -hmm. concrete as a material. So it is now uh, how we would like to use this material. And um, there are a number of applications you could do, as, as you mentioned, um, environmental aspects. Um, one thing that uh, their uh, concrete is known for is that it takes a lot of energy to create mm -hmm. cement which is the main uh, ingredient that binds uh, the materials of concrete. And that cement um, requires energy and releases uh, also carbon dioxide in mm -hmm. its production. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you go into the slides, you'll see that uh, clinker is from the manufacturing process. And with that clinker, they mix other ingredients to create cement. But it takes a lot of energy to heat up uh, the materials to make clinker. I, I uh, think so it's close to 3,000 degrees. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, mm -hmm. but uh, it uh, takes a lot of energy, which typically uh, con um, cement plants use um, coal mm -hmm. to generate mm -hmm. that sort of, the most efficient uh, material to generate that kind of energy. So uh, from a carbon footprint standpoint, it has a high embodied energy, embodied carbon footprint. Uh, and so what we have done as an industry, and many uh, uh, in the design community are well aware that they could substitute that cement form uh, with an industrial byproduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and these industrial byproducts can be substituted in there. Uh, they're called supplementary cementitious material, such that they will be kept out of the landfills Mm -hmm. and can be used practically uh, in construction practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of those would be uh, fly ash, that's a byproduct of burning coal. And, and uh, we do have a coal burning plant out have in Campbell Industrial. Yeah. Uh, there's also blast furnace slag, uh, which is what we use a lot in the Pacific Northwest uh, because we don't fire up our coal plants that often. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, silica fume that is um, literally smoke from the manufacturing process of silica. Uh, so the chips that go into our computers. Mm -hmm. um, so those are substitutes and they're not just uh, simply keeping industrial byproducts out of the landfills, but in fact they enhance the performance of concrete, making it stronger, uh, more durable. You know, I think I've seen our local concrete trucks that say something to the effect of enhanced with fly ash, a waste material, or something like that. Yes, that's correct. Oh, was that because of you, <laughs> Wayne? You, uh, one of our member firms, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. They do use a fly ash. It, as uh, you mentioned earlier, it is from one of our coal facilities uh, at Kamalusha Park. It's uh, used on a limited basis uh, because of some of the um, 
the characteristics of that particular fly ash. Uh, uh, so we do supplement with importing uh, fly ash as well. And let me divert a little bit and we can get back to the environmental benefits, but it was just yesterday, I was, we have a neighborhood here called Kaka'ako that's zooming up. A, the high rises are just going up, up, up very, very rapidly. And I was looking way, way, way up there on the 36th or 40th floor, and I know how rapidly these buildings have gone up. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, what in the world would happen if there were an earthquake? How in the world can a high, narrow building like that withstand an earthquake? And I suspect some of it has to do with the properties of uh, concrete? Or, or, or would that be strictly the, the rebar properties? Or uh, How do you hold those things up? Well, it's uh, <laughs> earthquake seismic design is uh, well uh, determined in our uh, codes. Uh, ASC, that's the American Society of Civil Engineers, has developed an ASC 7 guiding document that talks about how to design for seismic loads and it is a combination, as you say, of both, for concrete buildings, a combination of both the steel, which is the rebar, mm -hmm. as well as the concrete. Steel for tension, concrete for compression. And so mm -hmm. um, it's, we've done it many times, mm -hmm. and there are certainly innovations happening all the time uh, that uh, allows us to build taller and stronger, even in the most uh, seismically prone areas. Mm -hmm. The, the prime example probably being Tokyo, where I, don't, I think buildings go up to 100 stories or something, and they're on some kind of pad that flows with, with the right. earthquakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's called yeah. a base isolation. Mm -hmm. So base isolation is to say that allows the ground to move while the building doesn't, uh, or at least slides mm -hmm. off uh, on there. But yes, a lot of innovations. I've also seen things with water tanks and rollers and all sorts of uh, innovations in yeah. seismic yeah. design. And there, right in the middle of it, is concrete. It doesn't crack, doesn't do anything. It just mm -hmm. goes with, with the flow. Just very, very, I was, again, staring at this building and saying, what if we started shaking? <laughs> so high. But yeah, as you said, innovations are uh, occurring every day. Yeah. That's a large part of what gives me pleasure as, as an energy codes person is to keep up with this. But back to uh, environmental benefits of, of concrete. I, I sort of interrupted us here. Uh, yeah, uh, the other ingredients, if we want to look at um, uh, the recycled aspects mm -hmm. of the material, uh, mm -hmm. we know that concrete is always a local material. You're not mm -hmm. going to be transporting concrete very far. Or very, you know, we, we in Hawaii, we think nothing is local. We import our lettuce, for goodness sakes. We import <laughs> our lumber. Yeah. Yes, and so, so yeah, concrete is always, <coughs> it has to be local. Uh, and so um, one of the things uh, that we can look more uh, towards uh, replacing uh, would be aggregate. If there are uh, available aggregates from a recycling concrete, mm -hmm. uh, recycled concrete aggregate is, uh, RCA is a way that you can limit the amount of virgin material extracted mm -hmm. from the ground. Mm -hmm. That certainly helps in the carbon footprint, uh, energy use, and uh, also uh, if there's enough demolition uh, that's mm -hmm. happening on the islands, uh, you can use that to, uh, you can use it up to 100% for road base and fills. Um, but uh, you can also use uh, return concrete, which is concrete that about 2 to 10 percent of any uh, concrete plant, uh, the road mm -hmm. material will go out, uh, I mean the material will go out and come back and um, uh, be used for something. They can make uh, concrete blocks out of them or uh, other things. Mm -hmm. So made. something that isn't, uh, doesn't need the structural strength of... Uh, right, yeah, uh, it, yeah, and yeah. it doesn't uh, require, it can use uh, what's left over from a mm -hmm. job site that mm -hmm. hasn't used all this concrete. So there are ways to recapture uh, some of that, that's as well as uh, water that's used in the production of concrete. We like that. We're very water conscious here. Right. So and on that tree note, why don't we take a break and get right back into the localness? Because uh, Wayne and I will agree, we 
I think of almost nothing as being locally produced. <laughs> so this is a very, very cheery and very, and very environmentally sound note to resume on. Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig, back in a moment. Aloha, this is Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Good afternoon again, Howard Wing, Cold Green Think Tech Hawaii. Let's talk concrete. My guests are longtime friend Wayne Kawano, known locally as Mr. Concrete, and all the way from Seattle, Mr. Maybe it's Doctor or Mr. No, just this Mr. Tian Peng, Government Relations <laughs> Chair for the <laughs> Recycle. No. What's the name of your outfit again? The National Ready Mixed Concrete um, Association. National Ready Mixed Concrete Association. How could we possibly forget that? Now, we were on a really, to me, and I'm, I'm sure to Wayne also, as, as uh, local people, uh, the fact that concrete is local. As I was saying, all the only local stuff we produce generally is we push agriculture a lot, and we do high-end food growing, and then the restaurants snap it up, and they say locally produced, and these are generally the high-end restaurants. And that's about all we produce, but you're telling us that we produce our own concrete, which from an environmental standpoint means we don't have to ship all that heavy stuff two and a half thousand miles in. That's, that's correct, Howard. Mm -hmm. um, we do have three ready-mix operations on the island of Oahu, as well as uh, two ready-mix companies uh, that manufacture concrete on the Big Island, mm. Maui, and Kauai. On Kauai, and L little old Kauai. Yes, they have oh. two mm. as well. And mm. uh, there <coughs> is one operation on Molokai really? as well. Uh, so, so these things can be modularized then to yeah. go down as far as you want because Molokai has only 7,000 people on it. Right, right, yeah. right. It's a small operation, yeah, but they, still, think so. they yeah. still can yeah. furnish the material there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the material, how does it magically appear here? Uh, yes, um, most of the um, uh, major ready mix operations do have a quarry operation uh, mm -hmm. where they do mine the aggregates. Uh, so, um, you know, to help make the concrete, and we talked about the, the water aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, the cement, uh, there was a time when, uh, uh, for many, many years, we did manufacture cement here locally. Mm -hmm. But we ceased that operation in um, uh, 1999. So from 2000 on to now, it's all imported mm -hmm. cement. But it, as we saw from an earlier slide, I think cement is only 10% of the that, total. That's yeah. correct. It's yeah. a very small part of what goes into making concrete. Mm -hmm. And so we're volcanic islands ranging in age, Kauai, 4 million years, and the big island is still forming. How in the world do you get the proper minerals to, to yeah. make this? Yes, uh, pr primarily it's uh, what we call the lava basalt aggregate. Mm -hmm. that, that's the uh, main uh, uh, material that is used uh, in the concrete mixes. Now, is that the lava that we see on the Big Island, or is it... I, I think the basalt is a very hard rock. Yeah, yes, it yeah. is a hard mm -hmm. rock, but uh, as you mentioned, because it's a, a rather relatively young uh, material, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that it is, uh, 
it can be somewhat porous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we call it uh, an absorption where the, sure. where the aggregate will absorb some moisture. Uh, but other than that, no, it's an um, it's excellent material for concrete. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so all we've got to import is the 10% cement, cement, yes. cement. And then if we can reuse that cement somehow, then we yeah. have to import e even less. Yes. Yeah. So you get this rock basalt, and then you grind it up. Again, you had that slide of all the individual ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so water, let's talk water. We're very, very, very uh, water conscious. I'm basically an energy efficiency guy, and I like to say the current wars are being fought over oil. The future wars will be fought over water. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that you can reuse water or use non-potable, non non-drinkable water in this process. Right. Uh, a lot of specifications mm -hmm. call for potable water for concrete, but uh, we found that uh, throughout the years that there's no problem in using non-potable water, mm -hmm. which means that you can use the recycled water from different aspects of the manufacturing process. Um, for instance, a truck uh, typically that comes back uh, to a plant after a job has to use uh, about 150 to 200 uh, gallons of water mm -hmm. per truck to, 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 to wash, wash it, it out. Yeah, yes, yeah, you have to yeah, wash yeah. it out. And so uh, you also have to wash the outside of the truck. Mm -hmm. You have to sprinkle the aggregate to keep them uh, moist, uh, you know, to a certain uh, moisture content. And so. Uh, you have to clean the site uh, of the concrete plant. So there's a significant amount of water being used on site of any job, any uh, manufacturing uh, uh, process for concrete that you can reuse some of that water, have to uh, make sure it's filtered and settled and uh, so that the water is uh, what you're taking and not any of the active ingredients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty clear looking water and, and the particulates settle at the, at the right. bottom and then you, when, when you harvest those particulates, can you reuse them in the process later or uh, you, you don't quite know what it is? I think you don't, yeah. you don't quite know what <coughs> it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you would, it would require some chemical analysis yeah. so that you don't add ingredients into a particular recipe that was uh, unintended so mm -hmm. that your mm -hmm. performance uh, might degrade or yeah, yeah. even get enhanced without you knowing it. So <laughs> and again, I'm looking at those high, 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 high buildings, and yeah. I want that concrete to be right to spec. That's right. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. So what else have we got in the way of uh, either environmental or other aspects of, of concrete? Well, uh, since uh, part of what uh, you do, uh, Howard, is mm -hmm. uh, dealing with energy, um, I think the best way to look at um, any materials is how it performs mm -hmm. as the end product. And so concrete, as uh, we mentioned, is uh, beloved by lots of uh, architects, designers, engineers, because we know it has strong, durable properties. Um, but we also know that it goes into a building that must last a certain life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the best way to look at any material, uh, any material's environmental aspects is look at the life cycle of any building. And so yeah, and th this is not Las Vegas where we tear down the building every <laughs> 10 years or something. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, we mentioned the term embodied uh, previously, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. embodied is the uh, amount of energy or carbon it takes to manufacture, extract and manufacture a product. Uh, but the operation and use phase, uh, if you go to slide 10 uh, of a life cycle, you'll see that in fact the use phase is the most, um, the longest phase or the highest environmental impact of any, uh, any production process from the production to the building to the uh, demolition um, mm -hmm. of a building, the use phase is where the environmental impacts will really truly make a difference. And so uh, concrete, uh, we know, is a, uh, a dense substance. And so that density allows it to have a thermal mass. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and thermal mass is accounted for in our building codes and uh, enough research out there to demonstrate that thermal mass has an energy benefit to the building. And we know that energy use uh, is the largest global warming potential or carbon mm -hmm. footprint mm -hmm. of any building. And so that use, whether it's to create comfort or to run the equipment, HVAC equipment, the lighting, uh, all that takes energy. And if the building is to last 60 years, 70 years, mm -hmm. we want that to be as most as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. So thermal mass is one way a building can minimize its energy use because thermal mass has a number of benefits. Benefits would be uh, it has this thermal lag, which means mm -hmm. um, it allows uh, uh, energy to be absorbed and then released later on. Right, so maybe you have a slide on that? Yeah, uh, that was the next slide we just saw, mm -hmm. actually slide 11. And uh, we see that that thermal lag allows mm -hmm. us to lower our energy costs because the cooling costs will be delayed. Uh, the cooling mm -hmm. demand is essentially delayed uh, here on the island. That's what primarily it is, cooling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the dampening effect, which means the peak heat heating times of the day is dampened so that you would need to only purchase smaller uh, HVAC equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, um, the temperature swings is what makes people uncomfortable. So for human comfort, we don't want these extreme temperature swings. And so by minimizing the temperature swings, we actually uh, also create um, thermal comfort for occupants. Mm -hmm. So a lot of benefits to having thermal mass, and we certainly know uh, from a lot of research that um, the carbon footprint of the total life cycle of a building is actually minimi minimized uh, by using a material with high uh, thermal mass, uh, such as concrete. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and in terms of uh, life, you described how energy intense the initial process is, right. but you extend that out for, as you said, 50, 60, maybe even more years, that initial energy use is spread over. You know, divide that initial use by 60 years. And <clears throat> maybe a good analogy to make is the old-fashioned incandescent lamps that we grew up with. They lasted, they burned for about 750 hours and the new LED lights, which may take more, no, they take probably about an equal amount of energy to produce, those are going to last five or ten years. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're spreading that initial cost out over many, many, many years. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. I think we think about, uh, in construction, uh, there's a tendency to think about initial cost. Mm -hmm. but oh, is there ever? I can testify to that. Right. <laughs> and so uh, if we get more uh, of the design community and the development community to understand life cycle costs, mm -hmm. they will benefit uh, not only financially but also uh, environmentally. Absolutely. As well. I, I spend a good deal of my professional career promoting exactly that right. as and the energy codes guy. Yeah, we have a, uh, I have a slide on slide 14. It shows uh, research that of exactly what we're talking about, which is uh, MIT's uh, Concrete mm -hmm. Sustainability Hub did mm -hmm. a life cycle analysis um, on residential, uh, single family, uh, multifamily, and uh, this commercial building, comparing it concrete to steel, concrete to wood, and they're all essentially the same results, which is you see in the green bar at the bottom, that's the embodied global warming potential. That is the carbon footprint of uh, the building. And you can see it's only about 10% of the overall uh, uh, carbon footprint of the building throughout its life. And uh, even though concrete uh, generally has a high embodied energy because of that initial process, 
at the end result after 60, 70 years, and this study was done for 60 years, we see that it actually uh, pays off because the thermal mass uh, benefited the building's energy efficiency. Now, the red portion of the bar is the energy used by the building? That's right, yeah. operations mm -hmm. phase. Oper yeah. So, so um, that would be the lighting, air conditioning, heating, and, that's and so right. forth. Yeah. yeah, very, very impressive there. Yeah. Okay, and on that cheery note, let's take break number two. Howard Wig, Code Green, back in a moment. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host High Growth with HTDC, where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing, because there are tons of things that are happening in Hawaii in those fields, and we like to share them with you because people, more people should know about them. The show broadcasts live every other Tuesday at 3 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii, and tune in, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He, he asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your uh, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world. And there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on Think Tech. Aloha. Good afternoon again. Howard Wig, Code Green. My distinguished guests, Wayne Kawano, Mr. Concrete of Hawaii, and not doctor. He talks like a doctor, but <laughs> Mr. Tian Peng the, of the Ready Mix Concrete Association traveled all the way down from the mainland just to talk concrete. Now, we've only got a few minutes left. What more do we need to uh, cover here now? Um, well, we were talking about some of the environmental benefits mm -hmm. of concrete used in our building structures. Yeah, and, and life, life cycle costing. And life yeah. cycle costing, life mm -hmm. cycle analysis. Um, uh, one thing uh, we have seen is that the building codes are tightening up and, make, and mm -hmm. becoming uh, energy codes as well, tightening up, making, uh, becoming more and more stringent and asking buildings to do more and more. That is be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing we uh, have considered for a long while is how the exterior environment forces the energy use in a building. So mm -hmm. if we can reduce the amount of uh, heating from the outside, uh, we might be able to reduce the amount of energy used to cool the yeah, inside absolutely. occupants. Yep. And so <coughs> uh, urban heat island effect is something we've seen in major cities including Honolulu, uh, where we see that it, in fact, will uh, increase the temperature of an urban environment between 5 to 9 percent uh, mm -hmm. compared to the countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, so because of that, uh, if we can lower the urban uh, heat island temperatures uh, for every uh, ten, for every 1 degree Fahrenheit, uh, the research has shown that we can reduce one and a half percent of our uh, cooling loads. Absolutely. So I, I, I work with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. That's right. Lawrence exactly Berkeley that. is yeah. the leader for mm -hmm. that study, and uh, lots of work on that have proven that. Uh, and we know that uh, it's uh, depending on the material solar reflectivity, mm -hmm. uh, which you alluded to before, mm -hmm. uh, it will help reduce the amount of heat in an urban environment. Ab absolutely, and let me take off on a little uh, tangent since you're talking very near and very dear to my heart. When I'm not uh, here, I am the energy codes person for Hawaii, and what I like to do, what I'm forced to do by certain outside parties is always consider cost when we're looking at upgrading our energy codes. And the current code that's just about to come down the pike 
requires <coughs> for mass buildings, concrete walls, are three, I believe it is, exterior insulation. That means you would have to put about that much what's called foam board on the exterior of the building. And we've done analyses of the effect of that in Hawaii's very mild climate. And just for instance, our, our residents, 2,000 foot residents, it would have added up to $8,000 to the cost of the home and the benefit, the cost benefit would have been just $160 a year. And if you do a, a, a payback analysis, it's a 43 year payback. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we did another study and it showed that if we shade that, in this case, concrete wall to a certain degree, or if we have a reflective surface on that wall, it will have the equal effect of R3 insulation. So we substituted that and we actually are reducing the cost of building while achieving the same uh, thermal retardants, keep keeping the heat out of the building. And as you're rapidly figuring out, that's all we're interested in Hawaii is keeping the heat out there. So that's just this little uh, aside pi pitch for yeah, and these energy uh, codes. The uh, reflectivity works um, both outdoors and in the interiors. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of studies, uh, lighting studies, that show that high reflectance values that you see with concrete material, for instance. It could be any material, but uh, we know that uh, high reflectance will reduce your lighting load because Absolutely. you will need yeah. 30 some odd percent less lighting than mm -hmm. you would had you had darker surfaces. And that's pretty common sense anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked at um, lighting for parking garages and I looked up at the, the ceiling because I'm involved in this sometimes. And of course it's a concrete ceiling. And I'm saying, why don't they paint that ceiling white to get more <laughs> reflectance down? But uh, doing further analysis, I find that uh, concrete has a pretty gosh darn good reflectance all, all by itself. Yeah, on slide uh, 16, uh, if you see the research that was done on a parking lot, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, research study is called Influence of Pavement Reflectance on Lighting. Mm -hmm. It showed that um, the same project required 37.5% reduction in the amount of lighting that is required uh, in parking lot because of its reflectivity. Mm -hmm. And the same would happen in, indoors as well. Yeah. You know, maybe I should amend our county codes as they're coming up to say <laughs> lighting requirement, it's called lighting power density, shall be reduced by 37% given we'll a high, high reflectance we'll surface. We'll be supporting that. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, another question, I always notice that our roads, as you've noticed now, are asphalt except for the bus pads where there's a bus stop. Why in the world is that? Why in the world is that, Wayne? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> you know, we know that, I think everybody knows that concrete is more durable mm -hmm. uh, in the long run than asphalt. Um, but again, first cost uh, mm -hmm. rule, mm -hmm. and uh, we have many of our roads as mm -hmm. asphalt because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't last as long, and they are always in a state of disrepair. We, we can attest to that, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but I think uh, when you have higher loads, uh, such as bus lanes or the turning uh, intersections where the cars mm -hmm. would turn, we've seen more and more um, uh, enlightenment, shall we say, from mm -hmm. the municipalities mm -hmm. that, oh, we should stop refixing these roads over and over mm -hmm. again and build it with something more durable. Hmm. That would, uh, you know, our mayor, his hair is getting white very rapidly, and that's because of all the criticism he gets because of the disrepair of our roads. Right. And us locals, we can, if, I, if you had to think of two or three new potholes that have uh, <laughs> resulted from the heavy rains we've had, I can certainly uh, do that. Yes. But you're saying if, I, I guess on a turn, you, you have a, a diagonal stress, is, is that it? Is that the, why they the, wear the, out? The, uh, uh, the wheels, the wearing uh, mm -hmm. on the surface uh, creates a lot of potholes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Something, uh, yeah, I wish, wish the mayor were uh, 
if he's watching. Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we've just got a few more minutes. Any other very enlightening concrete-related uh, things to say here? Uh, we could talk about uh, stormwater management. We with, certainly uh, can. Yeah. I think just certainly enough uh, stormwater management issues here that we can, mm -hmm. instead of hiding our stormwater infrastructure in cul culverts and underground, mm -hmm. we can bring them to the surface. And uh, a lot of that can be managed on site with uh, pervious concrete, a pervious material mm -hmm. that allows mm -hmm. Uh, infiltration right into the um, uh, where the rainwater lands. Absolutely, and a, an added benefit for this island is we get our water <coughs> from a water table underneath us. So if you had concrete that allowed the water to permeate, it would go down. It would take a while, but it would go down mm -hmm. to to the water table. Yeah, it recharges the water mm -hmm. table because we have all this covered surfaces as the mm -hmm. population explodes. Right building, more roads, more buildings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are now no longer allowing the, uh, the water table to recharge. Yeah. Now, I would think, this is a devil's advocate question, that if you had previous concrete, it would lose a lot of its uh, structural du durability. Is that the case? Uh, no, there's no, um, yeah. the, you, the design uh, professionals, the engineers, design the uh, pervious mm -hmm. to the specifications that's required, mm -hmm. and it can be as durable as needed. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a requirement that they have to meet, and uh, they do it. So this would be a, a good example might be that uh, parking lot that we saw, yeah. because you don't have the structural uh, stress on a parking lot that you do on a road right. where people are going 50, 60 miles an hour, I would say. Yeah. That's, right. that's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've uh, kind of approached it as a hybrid design, if you will, mm -hmm. where uh, on a typical parking lot, uh, we would incorporate not only the pervious and the parking stalls, but the drive-through lanes would be your conventional mm -hmm. concrete, mm -hmm. so it would be a hybrid. And I'm encouraged. Uh, we have had um, several projects completed and you know continue to on uh, ongoing right now mm -hmm. so uh, yeah I, I, I'm encouraged that um, people are starting to see the value in pervious concrete and we certainly hope to uh, continue that and uh, lead leadership and energy efficient design I believe rewards pervious concrete yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah it rewards uh, stormwater management solutions mm -hmm. that allow uh, stormwater and rainwater to infiltrate on site. Yeah. And it can yeah. be done a number of ways, green roofs and so on, but mm -hmm. certainly Pervious is one of the approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the uh, related question, I've seen a couple of uh, residential buildings, high end, that have uh, concrete with a lot of air in it, and that's supposed to uh, improve the insulation capabilities. Any, are you familiar with that at all? Or? Uh, well, I think um, uh, we have to distinguish between uh, insulation values mm -hmm. and uh, thermal mass because uh, the intention of concrete as a thermal mass is to um, have uh, absorbed the energy to mm -hmm. release it at a later time. Insulation, such as bad, uh, you know, uh, Board, uh, mm -hmm. and that type of insulation is really just to prevent the heat transfer yeah. between one yeah. space to another. And so they act uh, together, uh, complementary to each other. They don't, uh, they can't be replaced for the other. So the aerated concrete might be for other performance reasons that mm -hmm. I don't know uh, that particular project. Yeah. And we're just getting warmed up, but it's time to say mm -hmm. fond farewell too. Wayne Kawano, Mr. Concrete of Hawaii, and Mr. Tian Ping from the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association. He's here in town to give several lectures. Gentlemen, thank you very much from Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks, Howard. Thank you very much, Howard.